look into entrepreneurship teachers. It's rule-based. It really is. Can I get product market fit? Can I get something people want to buy? Okay, check. Do the unit level economics make sense? Do I make money on every sale? Can I keep the cost of running that business extremely low? And can I build that business so it's flexible so that I can do it a lot during the summer and a little bit during the school year? Those alternative sources of income, you could easily double your salary. And I think that's the number one point of leverage for teachers is to use that free time to make money if you want. Hello and welcome to the Optimal Agency Podcast. My name is Patrick Cummings, joined as always by John Gilson. Together with you, we are exploring the ideas of agency, diving deep to discover a set of guidelines on how each of us can best operate in the day-to-day to maximize our personal autonomy, professional freedom, and ultimately our positive impact on the world. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Greetings to you, my friend. How are you? <laughs> Greetings, Patrick. I am I am inundated with uh, with very willful cats today. <laughs> uh, the best way to be. That's what I say. Uh, every other week here on the show, we talk through a question sent to us by a listener. That's what we've got this time around. And then next week and every other week, we have a longer discussion on how we can own our lives by becoming optimal agents. Be sure you are subscribed or following wherever you are listening to this so you don't miss one of those. If you would like to get a question into a future episode, we surely would love it. The best way to do so is to head to optimalagency.co slash questions. Drop us a little bit about yourself and your question uh, and let us know health, wealth, or time, and we will do our best to get it into a future episode. You can also get a question in simply by responding to any one of our weekly newsletters, which we send out on Tuesday mornings, and you can get that. Make sure you're getting that because they're very good. Optimalagency.co slash newsletter. Both those links are in the show notes. We have a question. We surely love our teachers and we apparently have a lot of teachers listening because we get lots of questions from teachers. And we've got another one this week. This is from Shanna. She or Shana. Uh, 40 years old, married, child-free, owns her home, and she works full-time as a high school counselor. This is her question. This year, I am making an effort to improve my wealth and financial security. I've been reading books, listening to podcasts, trying to generally become more financially literate. In addition to having a three-month emergency fund, I recently opened an HYSA and have started my investing journey. So far in all my research, I've yet to hear anyone address wealth strategies uh, for public education employees. Although no one enters the field to be wealthy, working in education does provide a relative degree of uh, security with a pension, time flexibility with extended breaks, and an opportunity to receive a paycheck uh, for our agency. Here are some of the realities of working in education. We're paid a salary schedule that increases annually, yet eventually caps out. Placement on the salary schedule is also determined by your education, so there's incentive to get higher degrees. There are no options to ask for raises off schedule. Second, Changing jobs and school districts often result in a loss of pay as you start at a lower step on the, ske- and on the salary schedule. There are also usually longevity incentives, so it often makes sense to stay put. Third, although some des- districts do offer a supplemental 403B, there is never a match. Fourth, we do not pay into Social Security, nor do we qualify for disability insurance. Fifth, we do not get paid vacation nor holiday pay. We are contracted for a specific number of days per year. While it's true that we are quote unquote off during the summer, we are not paid for that time unless you opt for deferred pay from your de- employer. When we aren't working, we are essentially unemployed and unable to qualify for unemployment. Although I can I although I can never ask for a raise, I joined union negotiations to advocate for higher salaries for for our union members. I consider this asking for an annual raise. I know not all public education employees have the time to take this on and not all have strong representation. Knowing that several of the wealth strategies do not apply or even or are even counterproductive considering the realities educators face, what specific strategies would you recommend for educators to optimize their wealth? Thank you for that for that very detailed question, Shana. Thanks for helping high school kids figure out what they want to do with their lives. Uh, They don't know, so I hope you do. So uh, thank you for your work. I appreciate it. Hey, my mom's a teacher. Uh, My grandmother, God rest her soul, teacher. Uh, My mother's sister, teacher, uh, all retired at this point and comfortably retired. In fact, all three of them comfortably retired. So the first thing I would say to teachers out there is, hey, Don't worry about this too much. You're going to be okay. And here's why. Okay, that pension. Less than 10% of the people in this country have a pension and you're getting one. Essentially, that is income for life, rock and roll. 
Okay. Shana, I want to take issue with the spirit of your question. Okay. You identified about seven bullet point limitations on reasons you can't <laughs> get rich or reasons it's hard for you to get rich by switching jobs, by getting an employer match and saving money in that traditional way, by advocating for yourself for a raise. Now, you're doing the right things. Okay. You've got a forced savings plan with your mortgage. In other words, you're investing in your home equity every month when you pay that bill. You've got a three-month emergency fund and you open an HSA. Uh, Pat, I looked, the H and the Y are really close to each other on the on the keyboard. So I think that that's a time. <laughs> There's no a, such thing as an HYSA. I, not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Okay, I was wondering that, about that. I could speculate. I'll go with typo. Yeah, I, I could speculate <laughs> for a bit, but that's a health savings account. So, hey, listen, you're okay. already crushing it. And so- Here's something counterintuitive, uh, Shana. Teachers are in the top five professions that become millionaires, according to Dave Ramsey's millionaire study. How about them apples? Okay. And uh, I thought that that was really, really interesting. And so I, I delved a little bit and I said, well, what, is, what does Dave Ramsey have to say about this? And of course, he's a personal finance blogger that you probably run about as in some of your research to improve your own wealth. He says, that, listen, teachers are rule followers. They're rule followers. If you tell them how to do something and that there are rules for getting it done, they're going to listen. Okay, mm -hmm. so cool. That's great. That's absolutely great. So what I want to do is hopefully help you elucidate those rules. Okay. Now, there are some factual inaccuracies. At least they can't. You, some of your assumptions cannot be spread across every teacher everywhere. One of those is that you don't contribute to Social Security. There are actually only 15 states in which teachers don't contribute to Social Security or receive the benefits. Thir that means there's 35 states in the United States where that's not the case. Okay, mm -hmm. You're contributing to your pension fund, of course. Okay, Now, moving districts moves you down the pay scale. Yeah, but it matters what the absolute pay scale is. In other words, if you are in a truly affluent district, even if you go to the bottom of the pay scale, you can make much, much more than you could in the middle of the pay scale elsewhere. So don't just bank on what they're telling you about seniority. Actually check okay, and look at those things. Now, you get paid more for more education. It's worth having a master's degree. Okay, I hope if you got one or if you're a teacher listening and you're in the process of getting one, get the cheapest damn one you can because they don't care if it says Harvard on that thing or Phoenix Online. Yep. It just needs to be from an accredited institution. Get the cheapest master's degree you can. You're teaching high school kids, which means you already know more than they do by a large margin. What you get, what you get from that master's degree, and I, you know, I'm sorry to be uh, Debbie Downer here. Uh, what you get for from it in terms of your ability to help those kids, I'm guessing is negligible. What you get from it and the ability to improve your income is tangible and real. Okay, yep. focus on one of those things, right? Focus on the one that benefits you. It's okay. And Pat, one of the things that I know about teachers, at least from observing my mom, is that she cares so deeply about those kids that she wouldn't sleep at night, that she'd be stressed mm -hmm. out, et cetera, and that she would constantly defer her own needs to theirs. Well, guess what need you don't have to defer to theirs? Your wealth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So go ahead and get that degree. So I also want to address the 403B. You don't get an employer match. Yeah, okay. But there's usually Roth options. There's also taxable options where you can contribute. It's essentially a 401k for everyone listening. It's just for public employees, right? And nonprofit employees. They, they use 403Bs. Uh, it's optional. Okay. So you don't get a match. I don't get a match as a self-employed person for mine either, but I use the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's take all of this stuff together and say, hey, Shana, you're probably on track to become a millionaire, whether you like it or not, because to your point, you're rather bound to your profession, right? You're going to get points for seniority. You're going to get points for staying longer. Uh, and you're probably going to take advantage of that. My mom, her sister, and her mother all worked for the same school district for their entire career, you probably will too. So what do you do about all this if you really want to get rich? You're already doing it. But know you're not getting rich teaching. That's number one. Mm. Rich, rich. Not this week. Okay. And so set up your personal cost of living accordingly. Can you live on your pension amount? 
you should be able to know approximately what that pension amount will be. If you can set yourself up to live on that today or within the next three or four or five years, guess what you don't have to do anymore? Contribute savings to anything for retirement. You don't have to put money into the 403B. You don't have to squirrel it away in a taxable account. You can just live your richest life by knowing you can live on your pension. Let's say you don't know that and you're not Shana, but your teacher who contributes to Social Security. Can you live on your pension plus Social Security? If you can do that, you're already set. You don't need to save for retirement. Right? If you don't have Social Security, can you? how much do you do the calculation? And you're a teacher, so look it up. You're smart enough. Okay, Let's do the calculation to say, how much do I need to contribute to my 403B at an assumed rate of return to cover my cost of living with the 403B withdrawal and the pension? Okay. So what do you do instead? What do you do when you no longer have to invest for retirement? Because you probably don't, frankly. Uh, you can invest in taxable accounts. That is, uh, it's fine to put money aside. And I just want to illustrate the power of compounding for everybody listening. If you, as a 40-year-old, Shane, invest $200 a month, which I'm betting you can swing, until retirement at 65, which is the typical teacher mandated retirement age, which is 25 years at a 7% return. And I put a margin of error on that return of plus or minus 2%. So you could get as little as a 5% return, as much as a 9% return. That 200 bucks a month by the time you retire could be 203 K, 203,000 if you got a 9% return or 114,000 if you got a 5% return. At my assumed 7% return, 150 grand. Mm-hmm. 200 bucks a month in the next 25 years will turn into 200, uh, uh, sorry, 150 grand. And that's a very small amount. So rock on. So, so know that and do those calculations. Plan where the end of this looks, what it looks like. Now, you mentioned that you're essentially unemployed during the summer. Okay. And that's a, that's a interesting way to look at it. The way I would look at it is you've got a lot of free time, not you're unemployed right? Because your job's going to be there in the fall. So you, come on. Okay. But if it's helpful for budgeting and deciding that you're going to live on less, or can you live on your pension plus social security plus 403B or pension plus 403B, take your pay over that 12 months, take the deferred payment just so you can budget against it. Don't have to. It's not technically the best financial decision, but if it makes it easier, take your pay peanut buttered over that 12 months. Do yeah. what you did. Uh, my mom was in the NEA union. Uh, everybody is in the NEA union, at least in, in my family, or was. Uh, and they took an active role in advocating for their own pay raises. Yeah, you can't ask for a raise. You can ask for a raise for everybody. <laughs> well, rock on. You know where else you can ask for a raise? The select board meeting. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not just the union. It's also the tax base of the town. And so if your select people are on board that increasing your pay or increasing the budget for your school district is a good idea uh, because it contributes and it does contribute to the future welfare of your community, you're going to be much more likely to get those raises. Your union isn't your only point of leverage almost anywhere in local government is. Here's another one. So when I grew up, my mom lived in a high cost of uh, living area and worked in a low cost of living area. She was a teacher in a poor school district and we lived in a rich school district. That's exactly the opposite of what you should yep. do. Because <laughs> yep. the tax base was high where we were and we paid into it and it was low where she was, which meant she didn't get paid hardly anything. Okay. Uh, do the opposite. Live in a low cost area and work in a high cost area. Okay. The tax base is going to be higher. You're 20 and you can often do this. 10 minute commute, 15 minute commute could get you across the town line where you'll make 20% more. And when you go home, you'll spend 20% less. Well, that's leverage in both directions, right? That's making as much as you're able and spending much less than you make through geographic arbitrage in a small area. Pretty cool. I also did the calculation for you, Shana. So you work 180 days a year, and then I'm going to assume there's probably another week of teacher development stuff. So maybe 190 days a year. Well, the standard nine to five uh, for a non-teacher with two weeks of vacation is, is 250 days a year. So if you're working 180 to 190 and the normal uh, job, I'm just laughing at the unemployment comment, you're not unemployed. Uh, the, the average person, uh, it, you're working about three quarters of what they are. 
as an actual job. It's a three quarter time job. Now let's overlay that on 40 working hours a week. What does that mean? It means you have 10 hours a week on average where you could do nothing. Awesome. Do it. Fine. Take it. As long as you're set for the future and you're happy, but you could also get alternative sources of income going during that time. Look into entrepreneurship teachers. You, it's it's rule based. It really is. Can I get product market fit? Can I get something people want to buy? Okay, check. Cool. Did the unit level economics and feel Google all these terms? Do the unit level economics make sense? Do I make money on every sale? Can I keep the cost of running that business extremely low? And can I build that business so it's flexible so that I can do it a lot during the summer and a little bit during the school year? Those alternative sources of income, you could easily double your salary. And I think that's the number one point of leverage for teachers, frankly, is to use that free time to make money if you want, mm -hmm. or use that free time for free time, because I know you're also fairly stressed. Mm -hmm. Here's the other place where uh, my advice to make as much as you're able uh, it will be helpful to you. Don't think about it as how much money can I make? Think about it also as how little effort can I put into making the money I do make. So when you have to go teach, I remember mom making lesson plans all summer long. I remember her grading papers under the, the, in the kitchen at night, late at night, like, you know, 10, 11 o'clock. She was all in all the time. I don't want that for teachers. I saw what that did to mom. She had insomnia. She didn't sleep. Don't do that. How do you minimize your out of school work? How do you minimize the time spent writing lesson plans, grading papers? Well, I want you to think about that. What would make this easier and still give the kids the education they need to get? Right? For a guidance counselor, it might be here are the here's the template I use to guide a kid through their college decisions. Here's the template I use to guide an at-risk kid away from drugs. Here's one I use to guide an at-risk kid away from risky sexual behavior. Here's one I use to get counseling, uh, professional psychiatric counseling for a kid who has violent tendencies, etc. Systematize your work because it's repetitive. And I've got a recommendation for you. Read a book. It's called Systems Thinking for Business by Rich Jolly. And you're going to say, John, I'm not in business. Yes, you are. You're in business for yourself. That's the business you're in at your job. Everybody, whether nine to five or an entrepreneur is in a business. So what is systems thinking? It's really simple. It boils down to identify points of leverage. What can I put in place as a system that will reduce the amount of time I need to spend doing this thing? If you learn to apply systems thinking to being a school counselor, you'll also learn to apply systems thinking to that side hustle that I just asked you to start. And in both cases, you'll have high leverage, low input. So that's the next step. The things, Shana, that you laid before us are all personal finance things. Your next step is to learn how to make as much money as you're able, not by leveraging what I've said to do in your personal finance situation, but by learning to be an entrepreneur, both in and outside of the, the walls of the school. One question. We talked recently, we answered another listener question <clears throat> a few weeks ago, and one of the things we were talking about or that you were pointing out is... Uh, and actually the question sort of embedded in the question is all about volatility and how, how do we deal with volatility? How do we plan for upcoming volatility? And one of the things that kept popping into my head as you were laying all that out for Shanna was like, there's actually a remarkable lack of volatility for her in her position, right? Like one of your pieces of advice was like, you probably already know what your pension will be or what your social security, like you can start to make because like we're always going to need teachers where education's not going away. Like there, there's a remarkable lack of volatility in, in the future of this particular profession, whereas entrepreneurship or any other job is like, there's, there is quite a bit of, a, we can't really say what you're going to be making in five years. If you're a, you know, vice president of manufacturing of widgets or whatever, because there's, there's lots of variables there. And so or actually, if think, you're going to be making anything at all, yeah, as a vice president exactly. of widgets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I just, I don't even know if I have a question. It's just an interesting, you know, she laid out all of these constraints where, whereas what I kept hearing was, yeah, those constraints are there, but the flip of that is a remarkable lack of volatility, volatility where the rest of us actually do have quite a bit of volatility. And so recognizing that there is a quite a, quite a bit of abundance in this position as well, and that it's not all 
hamstrung and I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'm not allowed to ask for this. Um, because there, there is a flip side and that flip side allows you to your point to have a really good sense of like what the next 25 years could look like, or most likely are going to look like. It's a sure thing. Yeah. You're almost impossible to fire in the absence of tremendous malfeasance because you're a union employee. You're hard to fire. You are almost certainly going to get cost of living increases if your union is worthwhile. You know what your pension is going to be, regardless of whether you contribute to Social Security or not. Man, you know, if you went to the average financial advisor and said, all this stuff is set in stone, he'd say, what do you need me for? It's right there on the spreadsheet. <laughs> yep. And so I think the one point for these teachers is you now, when you have that much surety in your life, when you have that much of a sure thing, you get to take risks. Mm. And those risks look like the risks you take outside your profession because they can't hurt you. They literally can't hurt you. In other words, if you start that business and it bombs, whatever, sure thing, right? You try and start to be an artist or a creator or a woodworker or a small business owner during, the, during that one quarter of your working time that's completely free. There's very little downside to it. And I think we look at teacher salaries and we say they're too low. We say they're too low. Uh, and I'd agree with that. I really would. You know, uh, but I think the flip side of that is if you divide them by 0.75, you get the time adjusted salary mm -hmm. for being a teacher and you get that la tremendous lack of volatility. And I think it's worth focusing on that because the other thing we've got in this country, Pat, is a tremendous lack of teachers. Mm -hmm. They People aren't entering the profession because of its perceived lack of wealth. They're also, you know who really doesn't enter the profession? Men. Yeah. Remarkable. Men. Men. Go to your kid's elementary school and find me the male teachers. There aren't any. And if there are, there's one or two. They are not the majority of the faculty. What does that mean? It means for the seven and a half hours a day, your kid's in school, they're not being exposed to male role models of any kind. We should be ashamed as men that we're allowing that to happen. Okay? And so if you're generally risk averse, if you want to help other people, help kids. And if you really want to help kids and you're a guy, consider the profession, mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and at risk of being political, children, boys and girls need male and female role models and they're not getting them at school. Agreed. Okay. So get in there. <laughs> get in there help those kids get that low vol volatility uh sorry volatility sure thing and by the way be an entrepreneur it's fun you get to create something else and you get this sense of not only building within your community uh but of building something that helps wider and you also get to be involved in your community not only as a teacher but perhaps in local government on or near your select board uh on or near your union stand up at your town meeting and say something Make the people in your town believe that teachers aren't just sucking money out of their property taxes or out of their pockets. You are the guide for the future of that town. You are the Virgil who's walking their kids through heaven and hell. <laughs> so stand up and say something and advocate for yourself. And, and, and thanks for teaching. Love it. All right. If you would like to get a question into a future episode, one more time, optimalagency.co slash questions. The link is in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Thanks for the notes you send us. John and I will be back next week for another episode of the Optimal Agency Podcast.